everyone, and welcome to Flip the Script Season 2, Episode 14, The Four Types of Expansion Selling and How to Deploy a Playbook for Each One of Them. My name is Beck Holland. I'm the CEO and founder of Flip the Script. Before we get going, if you do me a favor, go to flipthescript.co and make sure you download the deck because this is a really meaty session. Once you've done that, let's go ahead and jump in. So first, per usual, let's start with an agenda. So full disclosure, it's going to be a really meaty session. So if you'd go ahead and download the deck so you can make sure to uh, march along at every step of the way. But there's going to be seven different pieces to the agenda today. Number one, uh, let's start with the definition of the four different types of expansion selling so that we have our minds around what are the different types and how can we go about them. Number two, what are not the key drivers to buyer happiness? So there's a lot of different false indicators from what I've seen um, that makes it look like your buyer is happy on paper, but isn't the actual truth. So we're going to march through what are all the different false indicators uh, that your buyer is happy when it's up for question on whether they truly are or not. Number three, how do I make my initial buyer happy? So before we even jump into the content, one of the first things that you need to make sure that's happening and that every one of these expansion sales are predicated on is how happy is your first buyer that you sold into. So I know we've all heard the saying, but don't reach for a branch before you, uh, you know, make the first branch happy, I think is the saying, or it should be. But basically, you want to make sure that your first buyer is happy and we'll march through all the steps that you can do that. Uh, and then number four through seven is going to be the playbook for each type of expansion sale. So we're going to go one, two, three, and four and go through an entire playbook of how you can march through these steps to make sure um, that you make the expansion sale happen. So let's start with what are the four types? So the four, and I put it in half types because we're going to cover one. Um, we're going to cover one type of expansion sale that's not truly an expansion sale, uh, sale, but still very important and worth of note. But the, the first type of expansion sell is going to be an upsell, and it is going to be selling the same functionality to additional users that have the same role within the same relative org. So this is what uh, a lot of people would typically refer to as an upsell, like the classic upsell, upsell. So today, let's use for an example that I am selling Outreach, the great sales engagement platform, and that I am selling uh, to LinkedIn for instance. So the first case scenario or a first type of expansion sell is let's imagine, for instance, that I sold into 100 BDRs over at LinkedIn Talent Solutions, and they actually have 400 BDRs in total. So the first type is an upsell where instead of the, the land was 100 BDRs and I'm upselling 300, the 300 BDR delta. So the first type of expansion selling is I'm increasing from 100 BDRs to 400 BDRs uh, net. And so that's where I'm making the expansion sell happen. And that is an upsell. The second type of expansion sell is another upsell. And this is when you sell additional features or functionality to the same core users that you originally sold to on the land within the same role, within the same org. So again, let's take uh, outreach selling into LinkedIn, Talent Solutions, for instance. And they sold originally on the land to 100 BDRs within, uh, with the sales engagement functionality. And let's imagine that they wanted to sell uh, pro services into the, that original 100 BDR. So that's the second type of expansion sell is you're selling additional features to the same person that you sold to off of the bat. The third type of expansion sell is going to be a cross sell. And this is going to be where you're selling the same functionality to different users within a different role, but within the same relative work. So with the uh, precursor example, if I was going to sell the same functionality of the sales engagement platform to different users in a different role, it would be in, my land was 100 BDRs over at Talent Solutions for LinkedIn. And the expand is I'm selling into account executives over at LinkedIn Talent Solutions. So a lot of different platforms, you know, they have multiple different buyer personas. I think that's pretty common among most orgs, you know, different feature sets, different functionality, et cetera, for different people. And so in this third type of expansion sell, it's really known as a cross sell where originally I was selling into the 100, BD, uh, 100 BDRs at Talent Solutions for LinkedIn uh, for outreach product. And then I want to cross sell into, they have account executives as well that might get some value for my product. And so I want to sell into the account executive division um, still within Talent Solutions at LinkedIn. And then the fourth type of expansion sell is going to be a cross sell again and this is going to be your prototypical cross-sell, what people think, especially within enterprise. So it's selling the same functionality 
to different users with the same role within a different relative org. So with the starting example of I originally on the land sold into, I was outreach and I sold in 100 BDR seats to the talent solutions division of LinkedIn. Well, LinkedIn doesn't just have the talent solutions division. They have multiple different divisions, for example, marketing solutions. So this fourth type of expansion sell is really a net new sale where I am selling from the 100 BDRs within uh, talent solutions over to a certain group of BDRs or AEs within marketing solutions. So still same parent company, but completely different division. So it's really like a net new sale. Uh, so those are the four types. There is a fifth type of not expansion business necessarily, but is certainly a way to keep revenue going, uh, certainly during a pandemic like we're, we're incurring right now. So this fifth type is very near and dear to my heart, and this is a resell. So typically a resell is going to be whenever someone churns from an org who was your decision maker or someone who is a functional user of your, um, you know, your, your platform. So again, let's say that there was a decision maker over at LinkedIn. I had sold into this decision maker um, when I was at Outreach. And then that person moved out of the, uh, the org and someone else came into the org to backfill their position. Happens all the time in tech. I think that the average churn rate for a VP of sales at this point is somewhere around 12 to 17 months. So we're constantly switching jobs, doing new things, you know, trying to get new skill set. And so the resell, I think, is the most overlooked kind of sale within an organization. And I think that most people just try to get an intro and hope for the best. And this can be uh, one quick way to churn your users <laughs> um, is basically someone else comes within the org and typically when they come in with them, you know, the rule of thumb is that they come in with people that they have worked with in their former org and they come in with a new tech stack. So uh, it doesn't mean that you're going to churn them right off the bat, but you also don't want to leave it up to fate. So another discussion for another time, but I think if an org is deadly or not, it's predicated on the resell of how well am I and how much am I prioritizing when a leader churns who is my decision maker or maybe someone who is a major champion or influencer for me in the selling cycle how well am I mitigating that and making sure that the new person is up to speed with my product and that the new person, you know, has everything they need, um, you know, to make sure that they, they stay on board with us and are satisfied. So now we know the four different types of expansion selling. So now let's go into what are not the key drivers for true buyer happiness. So when it comes to making a buyer truly happy, I have seen the following eight items be the most aggressively deployed playbook by either customer success reps or account, you know, AMs, RMs, and account executives. So number one is training sessions. To me, this is table stakes, but is not a reason to believe that your customer is truly happy. So, you know, typically when I see reps, for instance, within an org, if they're unhappy working at the org, I ask them, how was your onboarding experience? And they say onboarding was great. The first couple of weeks was great, but the delta on whether they're happening is much more beyond onboarding. So they typically don't even remember the onboarding. So as far as training sessions, again, they're going to be table stakes, but they're not a reason to believe that your buyer is really happy. Number two, uh, another way that doesn't necessarily make them successful or happy is sending push emails to use your product. I've seen a lot of different marketing campaigns or you know customer cam uh, advocacy campaigns where basically they're saying, oh, I just need to remind them more. I just need to remind them more to use my software and that will drive adoption and that means that my buyers are happy. So again, I get the theory behind it that if I send push emails and you want it to be top of mind, but not a true indicator on whether someone's happy or not. So I can think of a myriad of different um, vendors that I've worked with in the past where I wasn't happy using their software and they were sending an aggressive amount of emails to me to remind me to get in their product and et cetera. But this is something that is a, a, a shell you know, driver, uh, but doesn't actually make your buyer happy. So the third most commonly deployed theory of how I can make my buyers happy is by bugging them more to use the product. I can think of a myriad of different examples where I have um, you know, been at a company where we were using, you know, we had bought, purchased some kind of software and basically the CSM just kept reaching out saying, you really should use it more, you should use it more. Like, you know, here's an email and a push a reminder, et cetera, to get you to, you know, use our software more, et cetera. And every single time that it's happened to me, all I've thought was this email was a waste of my, my time. 
and I'm not going to use a product more because of it. So I know that the, I know where the heart is and I know where the intent is. And it's definitely important to stay top of mind with our buyers. And we'll get um, into how to make them happy in a second. But this is the most thir uh, third most commonly used myth that this will make my buyers happy if I just you know send them more emails to use my product. Number four, the most uh, fourth most commonly used tactic to get buyers happy is being really nice around renewal. <laughs> I've seen a lot of different vendors ghost me for months two through 11. And then all of a sudden around month 11, they're like, happy Thanksgiving. Oh my gosh, I hope you're well. Like, blah, blah, blah. How's the product been going? And I'm like, wait, too little, too late. <laughs> But this is a commonly deployed tactic where I've seen either CSMs, AEs, et cetera, basically only warm up to me around renewal when they are scared that I'm going to churn because either I haven't been in the product much or et cetera, but they are only putting their eggs in the basket around when renewal happens. So that's the uh, fourth most commonly uh, misused myth uh, that if you check in in November, that all of a sudden I'm going to be happy because I heard from you. The fifth one is asking people to write third-party reviews. So the theory goes like this. If I get my customers to write third-party reviews, they'll feel A, some kind of buy-in, and B, this makes them feel valued by my org. I cannot tell you the amount of third-party reviews that I have uh, heard of whenever I see someone that I know write a third-party review and then I ping them and I say, hey, so it sounds like you're really liking X, this piece of software. And they go, oh, not really. The marketing team just really, you know, whatever is going on behind the team. The marketing team just really wanted me to and I felt kind of bad and I really liked the CSM. And so I wrote this third party review just to kind of, you know, give them the push that they needed. But without fail, it's never been 100%. I would argue never been over 50% in my experience of these reviews are people that are genuinely happy and genuinely satisfied by their experience with a vendor. So I can think on one hand, and again, we're going to get into the magic sauce in a minute of how to make them truly happy. I can count on one hand the amount of times I have heard about someone raving about, truly raving about a software where they're like, you have to try this thing. It's so, so good, etc. And so we'll get into the how of it before, but you know, someone who's written a third party review does not necessarily mean they're happy, even if they've uh, gone to the length of they're willing to write, put words on paper about you. Uh, number six, inviting your customers to customer appreciation events. Again, all great things to do, but doesn't mean that they're necessarily happy. I can uh, think through subjectively all the different times that I've seen people be at a customer appreciation event you know, marketing is tasked with, uh, hey, you need to set up some kind of event to make our customers happy. You know, then it becomes a collaboration with sales of, oh, you need to reach out to these customers. And all of a sudden the customer is like, oh, can I make it to that dinner? You know, can I make it to that, you know, trip to Napa or whatever? You know, and they, they might actually go to the event and they might enjoy their time there, but that doesn't make them happy with the vendor. You know, it might be a reinforcement, best case scenario, a reinforcement that they like the vendor, but it certainly is not the cause. So you want to be able to drive the cause and then, you know, use these customer appreciation events as a bonus. But this is certainly not something that makes someone happy. Uh, number seven, focusing on NPS score. I want everyone, if you're about to shoot daggers uh, towards me or my LinkedIn or, or my email, which I totally understand, NPS score, I want you to first take off your marketer hat or your seller hat, and I want you to put on your uh, prospect hat or your customer hat. I want you to think through any time that you have answered a survey on how well something did for you. You know, if you truly thought about it, thought on a scale of one to 10, how happy am I? And what are the reasons behind why? So Typically, you know, with people that I know or myself, I'll throw myself in the fire. I see an NPS score and it's like, maybe I answer it, maybe I don't. And if I do, I'm very haphazard about how I answer it. I'm like, ah, 10. Great. Like, whatever is going to get me through the customer service line faster. Yeah, I'll do the review on the back end because I'm not convinced that you don't prioritize me based on doing that review. So NPS score, you know, I've seen customers with a nine NPS score who are furious. I've seen customers with a two NPS score that were actually happy. 
So I have not seen a strong correlation to NPS score and true customer happiness. Uh, again, I hate to, to uh, tease you out here a little bit, but uh, we'll get into the drivers of it in a minute. But focusing solely on NPS score or even primarily on NPS score can be really dangerous to your org because it's because of buyer behavior and because of all the things that we have in our day, it's not a true indicator of where someone's at. It's just a true indicator of best case scenario of where the people were at that filled out the survey, certainly not my entire customer base. And not even then do I think it doesn't give you a really good litmus test of where those people were at. So the eighth uh, factor that's not a true driver to customer happiness is asking them to do a case study. Again, I know the theory, it's very similar to point number five on asking them to do a third party review, but I have drilled down to case studies. And again, it could just be me and could just be all the case studies that I've talked to, but I have never met a case study where I said, Hey, I, you know, I, I talked to the person of like, Oh, I saw that you were featured on this thing. What do you think? It seems like you really like it. And they're like, ah, oh, it's okay. I just, et cetera, et cetera. So it's never a head on direct match of what they're saying in the case study is truly a reflection on how they feel. So, you know, they do it for a multitude of reasons, but I would just say it's not, uh, it's certainly not disadvantageous if they've done a case study, but I don't think that it's a true litmus test on whether someone is really happy with your product. So now we know the typical indicators of buyer happiness that aren't an actual litmus test. Now we know a big long list of all the stuff we've been markering ourselves on that isn't a true indicator and is a false indicator that someone's happy. But what is? What's a really good litmus test for what makes your buyer happy? How can I make my buyer happy? What really matters to them? And how can I get them to rant, rave, review, and take us on board if they were to go to another company because of how much value they saw? There is one thing that I've always seen drive true buyer happiness. And it's probably the hardest thing for companies to achieve. And it is the following. When your product freaking works, that's what makes your buyer happy. When your product actually works. Number one, does it work really well? Was deployment really easy? Do I understand it? Did I have to invest a ton of time to get there or only a little bit of time? But does the product actually work, number one? And number two, which is the hardest marker that I have seen zero organizations do insatiably well, is did I achieve the outcome I was looking for when I purchased this product? It is a very high bar to deliver that. And I understand that it is not our responsibility. It is not my responsibility necessarily to help you deploy the product in a way that's understandable, to help your team, entire team understand it, for to put together a methodology to where when you deploy this, it's plug and play and you see more quota attainment because you put in that software. I don't know if I'm nuts here. I'm just going to call out the elephant in the room. But my belief is that you should be able to deploy a software and that because of that, if you are the average customer, you should be able to achieve the outcome that you are looking to solve for. So I'll give you an example. I have been going through this a consultative phase of, you know, okay, we've got a lot of videos, but part of the flip the script business is going to be consulting. And I have been talking to about 10 enterprise companies. And each one of these companies has asked me the same thing somewhere in the process. They've said, are you willing to be performance-based? Are you willing to put your neck out on the line to where you, what you say you can deliver that you are on paper for delivering? Now, there's going to be a lot of different opinions on this, on how are you bottleneck? You know, will they adhere to the process that you gave them? Will they, you know, sit down and take the time to understand your product? Will they, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They're not just going to let you walk into their org, right, and take the joystick over. However, this is the one thing that makes customers happy. So I think that we need to make a massive stride in the industry to make a stride towards, you know, how do I not only deploy this with my customers well, how do I onboard them well? How do I train them well? But how do I help them? I mean, now I've just got an empty Netflix console. 
how do I help them understand from a high level and in the weeds how to deploy this and what kind of messaging, for instance, to put in the software to really help them achieve more quota. So again, very, very hard, hard bar, very, very high bar for organizations. But instead of viewing it as a responsibility, I think that we can view it as what an amazing opportunity. If I could make my buyers happy by helping them deliver and going above and beyond, but helping them deliver on the outcome that they actually were looking to achieve, the adoption is there. You don't have to send them any more emails. So the few products that I said that I mentioned that I've heard people rave about were the products that not only worked and worked without many bugs, et cetera, and were self, you know, you could understand it on your own, but were ones that were impact driven and actually delivered on the goal that they were looking to achieve when they buy software. So I'll sum it up with this. No one buys software to buy software. They buy software for an outcome. So I would be monomaniacal about understanding what is typically within buyer persona, the core outcome that they're looking to achieve through buying my software, and how can I help with insane limits and cost-effective limits bridge the gap for my users to get there. So there's a lot of different factors that come into this. I mentioned a number of them, but let's just review over the top eight that I've seen. Number one is ease of deployment. Number two is Execution of the product is self-explanatory or for your SMB customers or customers that you can't spend individualized time with, that they have very, very great best in practice manuals. The number one company that comes to mind, and I know I say them a lot, I'm super, super fangirl over them, is Outreach. Outreach is a sales engagement platform. Uh, Manny, if you're watching this, I absolutely love your company. <laughs> Uh, not just because you're sponsoring, uh, but because you're an amazing organization. This is one of their marquee things that they do well. So Outreach has all kinds of users. SMB users, they have mid-market users, enterprise users, strategic users, you know, companies that are using, uh, using them for deployment. And for the SMB companies, I have bought them when I was an SMB company. I actually bought one license as an SMB company. And even though they couldn't spend an exhaustive amount of time for, through customer success, actually the, rep, the customer success rep gave me an unbelievable user dream. He said, okay, I can only spend two hours on the phone with you, even though I was only buying one seat, which I thought was a gift. But number two, every single time that I asked him a question, I'd ping him on LinkedIn. I would ping him you know, over email and say, like, I have a question about this thing. I understand that you can't give me an hour. And he would always send me some kind of very self-explanatory video where the mouse would be scrolling up to something. It would be hitting custom tags or whatever it was. And it helped me get to know his product better, even though it, you know, in super, in a super cost-effective manner to outreach of, you know, if you really focus on best in practice manuals, you just enabled users regardless of who they are. And you only spent the time to make one video to do it or, you know, a hundred videos to do it or however many you need. But I think execution of the product should be very self-explanatory, have intuitive best in practice manuals, and be coupled with a great customer success team. So most companies that I know within hyper growth, they don't have the option or luxury of spending a ton of time with someone. And so I would say invest very heavily in having a very high quality best in practice manual system so people can do it very logically themselves. So when I'm thinking about these videos, for instance, I'm not thinking of, do I think th that I did well? Or do I think the session was really meaty? Or do I think the session went super in depth? My litmus test is can someone do what I was talking about in the video without me? That is the true marker of how good your content is or how good uh, your best in practice manuals are. So keep that in mind is your litmus test or your grading metric is off of how, how well a quote unquote average Joe or Jane watching something or seeing your best in practice manual could on average deploy it without having you involved. Uh, number three, do they achieve the goal? Do they achieve the goal that they were after for? They, they were after in buying your product. So again, people love to buy impact. They want to buy impact more, more and more and more these days. So it's like, you know, they're looking at like, can a vendor really deliver and have an SLA of the impact is what they want. And I understand that that's ne not necessarily achievable in all case scenarios, 
but what an opportunity. So I would focus on, um, you know, making sure that your customers, before you even start to expand, before you even start to have the temerity to expansion sell within the org, understand if they have achieved the goal that they originally at the onset were seeking and buying your product. Uh, number four, deliver training towards their specific use case is a great way. You know, if I'm a BDR leader or if I'm an AE leader, two very, very different leaders. So I would try and focus my training that I did do with the team as much to their buyer percent use case as I could. Number five, kind of a mirror on number three. Did they get the goal they were after with you? And did they get it in a scalable and repeatable way? Let me give you an example. I am from Texas originally. I'm actually doing a lot of the filming. Um, you know, I'm back in Texas for quarantine. I'm doing most of the filming for uh, season two here and season one. And being from Texas, one of the best things about living in Texas is the Texas State Fair. The State Fair comes around every late September through October. And as a child up and through adulthood, it's one of my favorite things that Texas does. So Everyone loves the fair. There's all kinds of food and rides and et cetera. But, you know, every single year with my family, I go to the state fair. And I remember when I was probably 11 or 12 years old, I was walking through the craft fair with my mom and I went up to a booth. And there was this booth where this guy was selling these kind of scrunchy things for your hair. But they were basically kind of a wireframe where you could really do your hair well in a great looking style and very, very quickly. So I watched him do it in the quote unquote demo two times. And I'm like, oh, that hair looks amazing. And I was super into it. And then he even taught me uh, how to do it in my own hair. So he used the scrunchie. He asked for you to buy it. So I bought the scrunchie, you know, and then he did my hair up and he did my mom's hair up. And he said, so these are the three steps of how to do it. You know, thanks for the purchase, et cetera. I went home from the state fair. I took the thing out. And the next morning I tried for three hours. <laughs> to get my hair to look like how he did in 30 seconds. I could not do it. My mom could not do it. We tried over and over and over again, and we never used the scrunchie again. So not only should our goal be, did they achieve the goal once with our software, but did they achieve the goal scalably? And did they achieve the goal without us? So that State Fair product, we spent $10 on this scrunchie and we never used it again. So how likely am I to buy a second scrunchie when I know when I came home, I would never be able to use um, the original scrunchie again. So we need to make sure that our customers can get the goal that they're after in a scalable, repeatable, and consistent fashion. So we make sure that they're very happy. Uh, number six, a quick, uh, a great way to make your customers happy is to have a very quick response to bugs with more than just an apology. Nothing more frustrating or placating, I might add, than uh, um, having an um, I'm sorry without having any kind of road forward to help make someone happy. And I'll give you a quick story here. I am starting a business. I called into the IRS because I need to get an EIN number. An EIN number is a number that basically you start your business based on. Uh, because of the pandemic, typically an EIN number takes three hours to get, sometimes on the spot. And because of the pandemic, I originally was told that it's not three hours, it's going to be three days. And then it went from three days to three weeks. And then it went from three weeks to 45 business days. So we're talking, you know, I don't even know what that is in terms of months, but two and a half months roughly that I have to wait to be an official business on paper. So I call into the customer service line and I'm trying to get the rep to check. I said, hey, can you check? It's only been 23 business days, but like I'm dying here. Can you, you know, check in on the EIN number? And I'll never forget ever for the rest of my life, thanks IRS, that I called and said, you know, can you at least check? Can you help me out here just so I know the progress on it? And she said, I'm sorry. And I said, is that it? And she said, yes, I'm just sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I can't check. I'm sorry, even if it's heartfelt, doesn't make the situation better. So a great way to make your buyers happy or to make them a little frustrated, and by a little I mean a lot, is to your only response to a bug, even if it's quick, being an apology. So you want to make sure that you eradicate the problem that your buyer is having um, and take a step to do that. That's a great way to make them truly happy. Uh, number seven is going to be, uh, did I deliver proactive help to them through the product? So 
you know, we want to help our buyers get to know our product more by making suggestions, not annoying amount of suggestions, but suggestions on way they could use, ways they could use it. So there's been a myriad of different examples in my head of basically I'm using some kind of software. I love the software because they're great and they're helping me with the outcome. And then they'll say, you know, hey, did you know that you can actually repurpose this and use this for X, Y, and Z? And it always leaves a good flavor in my mouth. And number eight, uh, do I deliver on the promises I made in the sales cycle to get the signature? We're all in sales, or at least most people who are probably watching this are to some degree. And we, our job is on getting the signature by and large, but you don't wanna do that at the expense of the relationship, at the expense of the customer's true happiness and the expense of ultimately the revenue for your org. So, you know, a quick way to get signatures is to promise a whole lot of things that the customer success rep couldn't deliver on or that your product can't deliver on in general. But I'd always push people to have integrity because long-term sale, that is it. So most people, you know, you're gonna get more business off of having a recurring sale and an expansion sale than you are to have a one-time churn. So I'd always focus on delivering, uh, any, anything that you say in the sales cycle needs to be able to be delivered on the back end. So that's how to make a buyer happy. So how does that fit into expansion selling? So again, here's the quick reminder of the four different types of expansion sell is uh, we're gonna start with selling the same functionality to additional users within the same role within the same relative org. So as a reminder, we're outreach, we're selling into LinkedIn. We sold into 100 BDR seats at LinkedIn and there's uh, 300 additional BDR seats that we want to sell into. So how we would do that in the playbook is going to be this. So number one, I would run the happiness playbook that we just went through. There's nothing more important before you start any type of expansion sell than doing this. So this is going to be 75%, whether we like it or not, of the expansion sell. Because if the first person didn't see value in us and the first person we didn't deliver on our promises and the first person, you know, didn't achieve their goal and the first person only got an I'm sorry when they had a bug and the first person didn't get a scalable result and the deployment was super messy and we couldn't figure out how to do it, then you're never going to get an expansion sell. So this is going to be the predication for all of the sales. But the first thing I would do is run that happiness playbook and make sure you're okay there. Second step is I would like to get clarity from the, uh, from the start. Clarity for the, from the start of what the expansion cell is. So you want to do this in a very light manner. You don't want to give indication to your buyer that you don't want to sell to them if you don't get the expansion cell. But I've seen too many, especially enterprise reps, say like, oh, okay, N4 has 800 reps. And it's like, well, N4 is only buying for 100. You know, and they assume that if they do well with those first 100, that N4 is going to hand over the other 700. So you always want to get clarity from the start of what the size of the opportunity is and do what I'd call pulling down the covers. So pulling down the covers is when a little kid gets scared, they jump in their bed and they pull the covers over their head and they don't want to look out. They don't want to look beyond the covers. It net net doesn't change the fact of if a monster is there but it changed their sight of it, which basically changes it in their mind that they're safe. So I see a lot of account executives not ask really tough questions that they need to ask because they're scared of the answer. So you need to pull the covers down and make sure that you ask the question from the jump in a very, again, respectful, polite tone and always convey to your buyer that you're extremely happy with the original sale, but you want to understand what the opportunity and what the uh, scope of the project is before you jump in. So I wouldn't assume that the upsell is on the table because of the initial sale. So too many times I've seen enterprise reps pour all their heart and soul into that first land because they're assuming that they can get the expand. And then the decision maker on the back end at month 10, you know, they put an aggressive amount into it. They forecasted it. And then the decision maker says, actually, they're not going to buy. They have no budget for this. And then I would rather know that up front than uh, knowing it at month 10. So the second step again is get clarity from the start of what the actual size of the opportunity is. Number three is I would understand the, the reasoning of the initial sale size. So let's say someone says, you know, let's use N4 as the example, they have 800 reps. You know, we didn't assume that because the original land was 100 that they'd give us the other 700. So we, you know, very politely asked about that. And they said, uh, yes, the expansion is on the table. We want to understand what is the reasoning, I would say out of genuine curiosity, no push, 
what is the reasoning behind buying the, uh, within these segments? Like, why why are you buying for these these 100? And they'll say a myriad of different things. The reality is, is you don't know the reasoning behind why they're buying for uh, only the original 100 and not 800. Typically, if it's enterprise, they're going to be doing it because of a, a couple of reasons. Number one, they want to make sure that your product actually works. Number two, they want to make sure the deployment works. Number three, they want to make sure it's secure. And number four, I would say all of the other hiccups that would go into a software, kind of like a mass bag. But they want to understand if on 100, if, if they actually get the outcome they achieve because they don't want the opportunity cost of deploying a software that doesn't work to 800 people. So, you know, if I'm a decision maker, it's about mitigating risk. Some of the game is about mitigating risk and being a good leader. So they want to make sure that the first 100 it's successful, you know, so that they can then expand the other 700 if they actually see the result. Because if my product doesn't work and you're selling into me and I'm in for, I want to understand like smallest group possible, you know, like 20, 50, max 100. Did this actually work? Did I like pricing? Did I like this vendor? And if not, I'll churn and go to the next vendor and figure it out. Like, you know, it obviously uh, didn't get me to my goal. So I want to make the opportunity costs and the risk of damage very, very low. So I would want to know for your buyer in specific, what is the reasoning behind the initial sales size? So it's gonna be a myriad of different topics, but I'd say typically it's all around those reasons, security, deployment, you know, does it work, you know, et cetera. What's the customer success look like? So I'd want, want to understand what's important to them. What do they want to see, you know, within that first hundred that they're worried about expanding to the other 700? It's not so you can expand on the spot. It's so that you can know within that first year, within that first trial run, et cetera, that that's what you need to, I mean, you need to do everything, but you need to really focus on that because that's a key indicator for them or something they're worried about. Uh, number four, kind of a mirror of number three, understanding their wins. Always within a sales cycle, but certainly for expansion selling, I would want to understand what is a win to your decision maker. So if they're buying something, they're not buying it without reason, right? Typically in B2B SaaS, especially, they're buying because of pain alleviation over pleasure, especially during the pandemic. So you want to understand what pain alleviation is or what threat alleviation is a win to your main decision maker. So that again, you can be very, very monomaniacally focused on that whenever you're in deployment or post-sale. So once you've done those, uh, those four, I would go into this step-by-step -step guide. Number one, what would make it set? This is the actual playbook that I would deploy on my buyer. Uh, number five, what would make it such a big win that it's a no-brainer for the others? I would ask that to my buyer. And uh, number two within number five is I would say, actually, before we go into that, let me repeat what I believe is important to you, to the core group, so I can make sure that I get this right. So I would want to have a conversation up front of like, what would make it such a big win to your organization that you would want to expand? Let's not even talk about if you're willing to let me expand but that you would want to spread this you know, to your other users within your organization. And I would say, before I go into that, let me repeat what my understanding is of what a big win is for you to the core group so I can make sure that I get that right. So if you're at this step in the game, you should know what's a win to your core user. You should have wrapped that up in step number four. You actually probably should have wrapped that up you know, early in the sales cycle of what they're looking for. But if you haven't at this point, then this is some good language to deploy of say like, what is the thing that if you got that out of the deal, then you would say like thumbs up, you know, this was a really good win for me. And it's going to be different for every buyer. So I've never been more astounded on when I ask questions like that's a good question. Why do you ask? Or what do you mean by that? And the responses that I've heard are very, very different from what I was assuming. So I would never assume what you think is a big win, but I also wouldn't leave all the work up to them. So I'd prep them with, you know, the information that you think is important to them to give a good indicator that you've been listening this whole time. Uh, number six, after I do that, I would run a playbook to stay in front of my functional buyer, decision maker, frontline manager, and end user. So this can look like a myriad of different things, but basically you want to make sure that whenever you're coming in for the expansion cell, people know who you are. They know who you are because they know they know you as a person, the guy or girl who helped them get better. 
So I would not leave it up to renewal time or I'd not leave it up to expansion time to get to know all the people within the org. You should be friends and at a texting distance from my perspective of you just have to send a text to ask someone how they're doing, et cetera, because you have been around that buyer so much that you've built relationships within the org. So, you know, a lot of the buying process for me is I am quote unquote networking. I'm getting to know all these different buyers and I'm trying to add value to their day. And then whenever I actually need to sell into them, sometimes it's been for the product that I was at. And sometimes I turn to another organization and it was still the same point person, you know, that I was within texting distance away because of the rapport that I had built with that buyer. So you want to run some kind of playbook where you know who the functional buyer is, decision maker, frontline manager, and end user. You should know that because of the original land, you know, and you make some kind of playbook, some kind of concerted effort to get in front of them and stay in front of them. So there's top of mind three people that I know do this insatiably well. My friend Dan actually does this really well, Smith over at uh, Winning by Design. And he constantly, when he sold into me at my original organization, um, he stayed in front of me, even for stuff that wasn't, uh, that didn't have to do with his product. He was constantly there and someone I could call. And so he's still a mentor to this day because of how much he was there. So you want to make sure that you run a playbook to stay in front of him. Uh, number seven. I would meet with the users proactively and regularly to get feedback on product usage. So if you don't know what your users think about your product or how it's going, you're already at a loss. So all of these are gonna be major, major detriments to expansion selling if you don't know this information already. So if I have no visibility into whether my users are actually using this product and why and what their names are, then I'm already at a major disadvantage if I'm coming in and asking for a second check. Asking for the first check is relatively easy. I know we think it's hard, but it's relatively easy. Asking for the second check is much harder because now they have experience with you of what it's like to work with you. So you want to make sure that that experience was very, very positive and a quick way to uncover ways. Every single software, there's going to be some hiccups. I would say, you know, you want to... Um, meet with the, you need to uncover the ways in which they're running into different kind of obstacles. And is there any way that I can alleviate these obstacles or get things out of their way um, so that they can use my product more effectively? I would meet with frontline managers, number eight, um, you know, same type of thing of like number seven that I'm meeting with the users for the product usage. And number eight, I'm meeting with their managers, frontline managers, both are very, very important. Seven is important for groundswell. Eight is important for purchasing power. So you want to have friends at both levels. So I would never say that frontline users aren't, the end users aren't important. I never say their managers aren't important. I'd never say their decision, the decision maker is important. So you should know everyone within the org and make sure that you're alleviating things and adding value to both. And then number nine, once you've done all of that, number nine, I would set what I call a prospect pack with my main decision maker on the expectation that needs to be met within the core group that you originally sold to in the land that has to be met for the upsell. So I would say something like, you know, again, their usage of your product has to be a positive one, unless you have an act of God sell that they absolutely need you. The demand is insatiably high and the supply is insatiably low. But for most of us plebeians within the industry, you have to make sure your original buyer is happy. So I would, once I have done all of that, I make sure that my buyer is insatiably happy. They're getting their goal. I've responded to their bugs with more than just, a, I'm sorry, you know, et cetera. I would set what I call a prospect pack, which is an agreement with your buyer of the things that have to happen for them to even be interested in an, in, um, an expansion cell. So again, I would always make sure that you don't think your buyer thinks that you are looking to the next branch. You would always word this carefully and be very, very, um, you know, inductively thinking of, you know, does this buyer now think that I don't value them in the original sale? Because that can cost you the expansion sale too. So just be very clear in your tone, your language, what you mention off record, um, so they know that you value their core business either way. After you've made your buyer happy, you executed on the goal, you've delivered on the promises, et cetera, you found out what's important to them, you've understood why they're buying for the certain core group of users, but not the others, you're being non-assumptive about that, you've stayed in front of the frontline managers, you've stayed in front of the end users, you've stayed in front of the decision maker, and you've made them all achieve their goals, you set a prospect pact of what they're looking for. All you have to do 
Very simple. Deliver and ask for the upsell. Sounds insane. The hardest part of expansion selling is delivering. Delivering on the original product usage. I cannot tell you how many countless buyers I have talked to that said, this person's asking me for more money even when they didn't deliver on the original ask. So you wanna deliver on all the things that we just went over and then just politely ask for the upsell. Set a prospect pact. Hey, you know, we talked about this originally, that this is what you wanna incur. You know, I, from my perspective, we got there, like this is the data, et cetera. Would you be willing, you know, I'm okay if you aren't, but would you be willing to go ahead and make the introduction to this next person? So that's playbook number one. Uh, and I will give you, that might be a crazy answer to number one, but I'll give you an example. There's an AE that I've worked with that literally just delivers and then politely asks. Politely asks of like, hey, this is a person that I need to talk to. And in expansion cell number one, it's going to be more users within the same function, meaning the decision maker for the first sale and the decision maker for the second sale of expansion is the same person, typically, you know, because it's an expansion. So you involve the decision maker for both. So you basically want to talk about the second, second deployment because you delivered on the first. Now let's talk about the second type of expansion sale. So the second type of expansion sale in review is selling an additional feature to the same core users. So again, we're selling into LinkedIn. You know, we sold to 100 BDRs and now we want to sell pro services uh, on top of the normal sales engagement. So first step is the same as an expansion sale number one. You want to run the happiness playbook. Focus on making your initial buyer successful, get them really, really happy, get them really successful from buying your core product so that they're more likely to buy this, the second. And then you want to uh, run what I call a building rapport with your original buyer playbook. So I've made my core buyer happy. How do I build rapport with them? What are some tricks, tips, techniques of how I can build rapport with someone? So I think we're past the stage where when you say, hey, Johnny, saw that you had that boat behind you in the picture, you know, what do you use the boat for? How much did the boat cost? Like the boat conversation is over. <laughs> So how do we build rapport with our buyer and how can we do that in a very systematic way? So the, the first part of the building rapport with your buyer playbook is I would have a reputation, it's a very high bar, have a reputation within your customer of telling the truth, of saving them money and of downselling when appropriate. There is no quicker way to build trust with someone than to tell them that they don't need to purchase something because they know that you're looking out for them. They could have made money, but they chose not to because they know that you could save money. So there's no quicker way than to tell the truth to your buyer and to downsell them when it's appropriate. So I would think when I'm quote unquote selling that actually I'm not after the short-term sale. I'm after the long-term sale. I'm after this person trusting me enough to open up their business to me. So downselling can be a great way to do that. But net net of it is you want to have a reputation within that buyer that you tell the truth, that you save them money, you find ways to do it, and you downsell them whenever they, uh, whenever necessary or appropriate. Um, I would understand all of the, no, step number two, I would understand most or multiple pain points, not just the ones that have to do with your product. We all get happy ears. And I know we hear the cha-ching sign whenever they start talking about pain points that have to do with their product. But they're just a person. They're one person that has 50 different problems within their role. And you want to have the reputation that you solve problems for them, regardless of whether that's to do with your product or not. The top three people that I mentioned earlier, they solved problems for me that weren't even their problems that they dealt with. They knew that I have five pain points, four of them or three of them had to do with their product of what their product can solve and two of them didn't. So if you have a quick and easy way of like, hey, I know that we sell sales engagement software, but I heard that, you know, you're having some... Um, it's hard for you to convert website views into close one business. Drift is a great way to do that, you know, uh, et cetera. You can pitch their product. Or if you don't have the budget for them, here's a quick way that you can do it on the hook. 
So I'm viewing, when I'm talking to someone, especially if they're a cold prospect, whenever they mention a pain point, regardless of whether it deals with my software or not, I almost see them as an equal weight of here's a pain point that I can solve. And if I can solve that pain point, especially if it's low in investment in terms of time from them, if it's free, if they didn't have to do much to get it, I'm seeing it as a win because now they trust me and now they want to buy from me. So there's been several different vendors, even in just flip the script and getting it off the ground that I have wanted to buy from them because of what they've done for me in the past. So you wanna have that within, um, when you're trying to build rapport with your prospect, that you understand all of the goals. So if there's a quick, easy, low hanging fruit that you can solve for them, it's just as powerful. I'd argue almost more powerful if it doesn't have to do with your product or isn't advantageous to you. Um, uh, 2C is basically gonna be, be close to the same thing. Understand, understand a wide array of what the buyer persona deals with in their day to day and how can you solve this. And then the fourth one is check in regularly, not only when there's an upsell on the table. So there's a couple of different people who essentially have come and uh, struck up a conversation with me only whenever it means money for them. You want to be your buyer's advocate. You want to constantly be in their corner and you don't want to conveniently check in whenever they raise money, <laughs> right? So you want to constantly make a very, very proactive effort of being in front of them and staying up to date with them and know what's going on with their business, not just when it means the upsell. So all of these things, they sound almost counterintuitive to selling, like this isn't true selling. I would argue this is the only thing to selling. Getting your product to work, <laughs> making sure that you're there for them and that you can solve pain points so then they want to buy from you if the product fit is there. Uh, number three, once I have built rapport with my buyer and I've run the happiness playbook and made them happy, number three, I would gain perspective from them. I would realize one thing in step number three. This might be crazy to hear. Your buyer isn't buying additional features as a reward for you delivering on, your on their first purchase. They bought the first purchase, you delivered on that. They're not going to buy additional features as a reward for you delivering. They are buying additional features based on a bet that those additional features will deliver on some goal they couldn't achieve through the additional through the core purchase. So I think a lot of people, especially let's say within promotions, I see a lot of people, they have their first role, let's say as an SDR, you know, and they hit quota. They hit quota well and they got 110% of quota, let's say. And they're like, well, I hit quota as an SDR, so you should make me as an AE. And I'm like, well, let's break that down. I'm not going to make you an AE based on you doing your job as an SDR. <laughs> I paid you as a reward for that. I hired you to do a job as an SDR and to do it well. And you did that and I paid you. That was your reward. I'm gonna only make you an account executive if I truly believe that you can be successful in that role. If you are going to crush it, if I think that you have the skills necessary to make it as an account executive. So I would never in my right mind promote someone from SDR to AE because they only because they hit their quota. I promote the kind of people that I'm like, yes, you hit your quota. This was a prerequisite, but I also think you have what it takes to be an account executive. So when it comes to your buyers, Realize when you are expansion selling number two, when you're selling them additional features, that they're not going to buy those additional features because you delivered on the first round. That's a prerequisite, but they're going to buy that additional feature set as a bet that that additional feature set will deliver on some goal they couldn't achieve with the core purchase. So I would gain that perspective and then I would ask them if they would be open to a lesser known idea or something that they haven't come across and uh, you don't believe they've come across on how they could achieve an additional goal that they have. So how would you know those additional goals that they have? Well, you should have asked them. They should know, you should know at this point what their pain points are in general. And if you have a good marker on your client, if you have a good relationship with your client, and if you've asked them the right questions and run the playbooks that I, I've uh, covered up to this point, 
you should know a good breadth of their of their pain points, not just ones that have to do with your product, but certainly ones that have to do with your product. So if they aren't open to talking about additional features, I would I would teach them if you ask this question and say like, hey, would you be open? Like, thanks so much for your original purchase. This has been amazing. Like I've had a blast working with you. Um, are you open to an idea that most people don't know about how you could achieve this separate goal? And if they say no, then I would say, oh, okay. Well, I'm gonna teach you, like number one, I would teach you how to do it with my product. But if they aren't open to that, I teach them how to do it without your product. There's no stronger conveyance of a message to your prospect that you care about them than helping them achieve your, their goal, regardless of what the, whether they use your product or not. So I would teach them, I would always have a great way to, um, uh, of how they can do it without buying something. So then they're more likely to buy the thing that speeds it up or makes it more effective. So great example is there's a, a lot of different times where in content or in videos, I want to tell people to just buy one piece of software because of how positive my experience is with them. But I also know that that's not always in every case scenario doable for people. So I wanna teach them how to do something without software along with how they can speed that up and do it with a software in specific. So you always wanna aim for both of those with your prospect. But in the meeting, let's say for a second that they do give you the meeting, that they say, yeah, I'd be open to go into that idea on how you can X, Y, and Z. In that meeting, I would go into um, how you could potentially solve the pain points that they've mentioned that you are, they're not currently addressing with your core purchase. So again, you should know them at this point. You should know what they're running into. You should know their top three struggles or four struggles. And if you haven't done that, you need to A, run better discovery, and B, you need to get in front of your prospects more and understand what they're going through in their day-to-day, -day, especially an expansion cell. An expansion cell typically means this is a, a better size org, mid-market, enterprise, strategic, et cetera. And so if you don't know those clients, you need to get to know them because if they have an expansion cell capability, it's typically gonna be someone very valuable in your book. So you should know those pain points. And in the, if they give you the meeting, I would go into how you could potentially help solve those pain points through your product. Uh, and the last step here is let them know, again, you wanna to reassure to them that either way, you're very appreciative of their core business. You don't want to risk the core sale at coming across sleazy because you're upselling. So always make sure that you've delivered on the first branch before you try to aim for the second. So now we know how to expansion sell into someone if we're going after more users within the same group and uh, expansion sell number two on if we're selling additional features to the core group, the first 100 BDRs. But what about expansion sell number three? So in review, expansion sale number three was when I'm trying to sell to different roles within the same core org. So again, let's take the example of I sold into LinkedIn, I was outreach and I sold into LinkedIn Talent Solutions and I sold into 100 BDRs on the land. And so expansion sale number three would be within Talent Solutions, there's also account executives that we sell to at outreach. So we want to learn how to sell into those account executives. So these are all building playbooks, by the way. So this is kind of a building session. So the first step is you wanna run the happiness playbook. Make sure you know what they're after, deliver on the outcomes, say uh, you respond to bugs with more than just an apology. Number two, you want to build, uh, or you want to run the building rapport with your original buyer playbook. Downsell them in appropriate cases, be around more than just when there's an upsell uh, dollar value etc. But you want to build rapport with your, uh, is, uh, run a playbook to, an aggressive playbook to build rapport with your core buyer. And then number three, you want to request, have a request from your core buyer. So we're going to name this the requesting from your core buyer playbook. So there are five things in order for your expansion cell number three, again, I sold to 100 BDRs at LinkedIn Talent Solutions, and now I wanna sell into the account executives. So there are five things that you can uh, ask for with your core prospect, and I put them in descending order of what works the most effectively down to what works the least effectively. So let's say your core decision maker for the 100 BDRs at LinkedIn, his name is David. And let's say the account executive leader over at LinkedIn Talent Solutions name is Jane. So you want to ask David, who's your core buyer, to make an intro to Jane 
with UNCC. That is the most uh, likely for conversion. So that's the most likely if you, if David makes intro with, to Jane with UNCC, you know, so that you can take it from there. That's the highest probability that you are going to get conversion, at least in my experience with my teams. If David says no to that, then the second thing you want to go for is that David writes an email to Jane without you and CC that you ghostwrite. So there's no one, hopefully, that can sell your product and is more relevant uh, to your buyer persona than you. So you want to go through, and the way you do pitch it to David is, hey, thanks so much for uh, uh, being willing to send over this email over to Jane. You know, to take some weight off your shoulders, uh, would you be willing if, uh, would you be open if I ghost wrote it for you? So you want to make sure you not control the narrative, but you give yourself the best shot on goal possible by you writing the email, because there's no one who will put more investment into that email than you. So second, you want to go for that David writes to Jane that you ghost write without UNCC. The third most prevalent uh, conversion is going to be David writes an email to Jane and basically you don't get to ghost write it. Sometimes people will say, no, I'm just going to write it to Jane. Don't worry about it, etc. By the way, these are good litmus tests to where your relationship is with your buyer. If your buyer won't do number one or number two, I would say you probably need to defer back to number, number one and two of this deck that you haven't made your buyer happy or you haven't built rapport with them. So there's some people, um, I think the Navy SEALs, their, uh, their motto for someone who is high, highly skilled but uh, low trust with their team is they say, I trust, trust you with my life, but I wouldn't tr trust you with my wife or my money. <laughs> So uh, sometimes if you have built, done the playbook of the happiness playbook of you've helped them execute on a goal, but you haven't built rapport with them, then they're probably in that same bucket of wouldn't trust you with their wife or money um, or husband or money. <laughs> um, so you want to make sure that you've nailed those two playbooks and a good litmus test, a test of if they won't do number one, arguably, you probably haven't done number one or number two on the previous slide very well. But certainly if they won't do number two, then I'd say you're probably up a creek and you need to focus on bucket one or two. But I'm going to go through these just so you have them. The third, uh, you know, example is they write an email. David writes to Jane without UNCC that you don't ghost, right? You know, that you try and go for that with David. David says no to that. You want to, the fourth likely uh, likelihood of conversion is you reach out to Jane where you can mention David and the first sale. And if David won't do that, you're probably really up a creek. But the last thing that you could do um, that will cause the least amount of conversion, but it's your best option at this point, is that you reach out to Jane, but you can't even mention that you're working with David. So at that point, you've probably messed up. You haven't built rapport with your buyer or you haven't delivered on something. And I'd say it's very unlikely that you will expansion sell at that point because Jane probably does know David. And Jane will say, wait, aren't you the person that sold into, you know, the talent solutions for the BDRs and will probably call David and David will relay that information. So now let's talk about expansion sale number four. So in review, expansion sale number four is probably the most commonly known type of expansion sale. So in review, it is, I am at Outreach. I sold into uh, LinkedIn talent solutions with 100 BDRs for the land. And now I want to expand to the marketing solutions division to either sell to the BDRs there or to um, account executives, either one. So this is the most prototypical thing pe people think about whenever they're talking about expansion selling. So let's go through the steps. Um, number one, run the happiness playbook. Again, make your core buyer happy and you can see it on the um, above slides. Number two, build rapport with your buyer. So you wanna run the building rapport with your original buyer playbook in detail. Number three, you know, I originally went through the core steps of, or the, the five different types of um, requesting from your core buyer, like to that playbook. So now I want to go into what does that playbook actually look like on the detailed level. So number one, let's talk about when your prospect makes, prospect A, so David in this case scenario, makes an intro with UNCC. So I want to give a couple of tips to each one of these processes, just so you know when you're doing this, how to do it really well. So number one, I would go for the meeting. David has just made an intro to uh, Jane with UNCC. And instead of the biggest mistake I see in that step is that the rep tries to say, tries to sell again. They try to act like 
they are earning the meeting. So the quickest way to see doubt into someone of whether they should take a meeting or not with you is to try to sell to them, <laughs> try to sell to them that they should take a meeting because now they're not convinced. So number one, I would not be timid and I would say, hey, Jane, you know, hi, Jane, so nice to meet you. You know, uh, David says some great things. Um, as far as, uh, for context, you know, we've uh, been working with Dave for the last two years to help drive more quota attainment across this team. You know, he thought uh, you might, send, uh, uh, he suggested that I reach out to you and that you would find some value. How does Wednesday at two look? So I would not be exhaustive. I would give them one sentence for um, some kind of context, but I would not be exhaustive in trying to sell because then Jane starts doubting whether she should give you time or not. Number two, if that's too much for Jane, for everyone who's watching this video and thinking, oh, that's too aggressive. Like what if Jane, you know, freaks out and basically says like, oh, this person's too aggressive. There's no quicker way to get a response than to apologize for something, to apologize within uh, like detail and actually nail on the head of what you did wrong or to break up with someone. So in this case scenario, you know, let's say you came in, you went for the kill. You said, how's one say it to Jane? Jane didn't respond. I would send over a fall on my sword email to Jane and I would say, hey, Jane, I just wanted to check in here and make sure I didn't overstep my bounds, you know, given my conversation, et cetera. And we can go into the, the text of this. If you go to the next session, I think it's uh, two sessions from now is going to be the actual messaging behind each one of these. So anytime that you see a number in parentheses with an asterisk mark, I am setting you up for in the next session on the messaging guide, the comprehensive messaging guide to expansion selling. I will go into detail of what that actual message looks like, uh, full disclosure, but I would send them some type of fall, Jane, some type, uh, type of fall in the sword email for being too aggressive right off the bat. And we can go into the messaging in the next session. Number three, if that doesn't work and Jane doesn't respond, I would ping the original buyer back, David, and I would have to, I would go for a coachable vibe and ask him what you should do next. So again, the actual text of that, number two, there's a star, so we're gonna go into the messaging guide. So let's talk about situation number two. Number two was David said no to the making an introduction with UNCC. And so you went for, hey, well, would you mind sending one over to Jane? Um, and he says, yes. And you say, okay, great. So to take some of the load off, why don't I ghostwrite it? And David says, yes. So my first tip is I would ghostwrite the message to David to send. So we can go into the text of that, number three in the comprehensive messaging guide um, in the next section. Uh, the second step I would do is if I didn't get a, if I didn't hear back from David within a week, I would send him a message, basically kind of falling on my sword a little bit and saying, how'd I do? You know, did Lisa respond, et cetera. Uh, number three, third step is I would go to Lisa on LinkedIn and I would add her, uh, add her. And we can go into the messaging obviously in the next session, but I would add Lisa on LinkedIn so that you put a name with a face whenever David's trying to sell. If you don't hear back from David at that point, I would send um, an advice email to basically David and I would ask him um, that, or I would tell him that you're getting the feeling that Lisa's not interested since you haven't heard back from him. And then the last step, if you don't send, uh, hear any response at that point, you're going to go ahead and send David a breakup email. So breakup emails, in my experience, are insanely effective. You can get a response within five minutes. If you send a breakup email and you just tell them that you're getting the feeling that it's not working out and you call out the reality. So people innately want to help you and pick you up, which I think is a great thing about humanity. So I would send a pro an email to prospect um, A, which is David, on the reality that uh, prospect B, which is uh, Jane, probably isn't seeing value since you haven't heard back from him at that point. Number three, the third case scenario is that prospect A, which is David, writes Jane a message where you don't get to uh, ghostwrite it. So very similar to the last playbook, except for you're taking off the first step. So the first step was you ghostwrote it. So you basically do the exact same playbook, but without the step of ghostwriting it. Uh, number four is when you're reaching out to, uh, if David said no to the first three, again, I would go back to steps one and two of find out, you know, make them more happy and build more rapport with them. But if this is your option and you're going to have to reach out to Jane, but David said you can go ahead and mention my name, 
then I would step number one, bind myself to prospect. Or I would bind myself to David and say, I'll let you know uh, if I'm able to get a hold of her. We'll go more into the messaging in the next se section. Session. Number two, I would go to Jane and I would give her reference and context of David sent you her way. I would uh, say David sent me your way because he let me know that all of the AEs are under your umbrella and uh, within marketing solutions. And I would give her a custom pitch on something that stood out to you about her on LinkedIn. You know, even better because you're selling into LinkedIn of like, you wrote this article, you said this thing, you engaged with this content, you know, and I really liked where you said X, Y, and Z. So I'd give a custom pitch there. Number three, uh, I would go back to I would go back to prospect B if uh, Jane doesn't respond, and I would basically give her a taste of accountability. You know, I would say something like, um, you know, I I was reading an article the other day about being relevant to my buyer, and I was convicted about what I sent to you. Um, you know, I'd like another shot to earn some of your time, and I'd go into another custom pitch. Again, we'll go into that messaging in the next session. Number four, I'd come back to prospect A, which was David. I would take accountability that what you're doing is not working with Jane, and I would take the mentee chair of where you should go next. Number five, I'd go back to uh, Jane, and I would say I would fall on my sword and add some piece of value, um, and then I would hard walk out the door. We'll go into the messaging later. And then the last step is I would go back to David and basically do the exact same thing. Fall on my sword. I would... Um, uh, fall on my sword that I didn't I, I didn't think I was relevant to Jane and then I would hard walk out the door and say I, I think that this isn't a fit. So in summary, it's very complex expansion selling and I know um, that most people want some kind of playbook of how to make it a net new sale but the reality is most of your buyers want to know that you deliver on the original promise. They want to know that what you said was the truth they want to know that you actually delivered on that outcome and that you helped them achieve that outcome by way of deployment, by way of helping them with bugs, by, well of, by way of helping them with messaging strategy or whatever it is. But the great thing about that is it presents a wonderful opportunity for us to raise the bar in terms of what we're willing to do for our, our customers and make them happy because of it. So that's it, everybody. Thanks so much for watching. If you like this session and want to hear more and expand your knowledge base, go to flipthescript.co to see all kinds of different selling topics. If you really like this session, be sure to tag Flip the Script and me on LinkedIn with your top two takeaways so I know what you want to hear more of. But either way, hope you have a great rest of your day. Watch out.